All right, Kelly, so this is the uh, very first bi-monthly article that Dad is going to do in 1979. He uh, most likely has teamed up with his PR group, which I believe probably consisted of a guy named Joe Whitlock, who was helping Dad at the time. Joe had been involved in motorsports, was working at Charlotte Motor Speedway, but also in other various roles, and uh, wrote an opinion column in the Grand National Scene at the time. But uh, So he's a great guy with a lot of connections and probably more than likely also being a journalist and a writer helped Dad uh, with doing these articles. Dad would not have wanted to do this. He would not have came to somebody and said, hey, I, got, I, I think I should do this. Joe or somebody went to Dad and said, this will help you connect to fans. You're a new guy. You've got to quickly make your name and establish yourself. Here's a great way to do it. So he writes these bi money bi monthly articles. And as we would learn, he's only going to write them up until May of the 600. So just the first third of the year. And uh, so we'll start with the very first one. Local rookie loves Grand National Racing is the title. Dale Earnhardt tells it like it is. So Dale Earnhardt is a promising 28 year old Winston Cup driver from Kannapolis. Is in the thick of the battle for the 1979 Grand National Rookie of the Year title. He's thrown his hat into the ring during a year that many experts agree has attracted the most talented lineup of rookie contenders in stock car racing history. Young Earnhardt, driving for the Charlotte-based Austrian racing team, wouldn't have it any other way. Competitive stock car racing has been the way of life for him for as long as he can remember. And that goes back to those barnstorming days during the 1950s and 60s when his Famous father, Ralph Earnhardt, was one of the winningest short track performance in, performers in the sport. Dale actually began racing in short track competition in 71. His father's untimely death in 73 had a profound effect on Dad. It was just a matter of having patience enough to wait for the best opportunity with the right team. And it finally came along. We're, we're definitely running for Rookie of the Year title, and that's not our main objective. We're racing to win, and we will win, says Dad. This is the first installment in a bi-monthly series by Dale Hart. It's a unique from-the-cockpit look in the 1979 Grand National scene by a rookie driver who expects to be a winner soon, and none of the so-called experts are betting against him. So, here we go. Let me tell you what happiness is. It's running right there in the front of the Daytona 500. I was trying not to grin, but I couldn't stop myself. We all know I wasn't up there at the end, though, I wasn't grinning then either. But wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. When the idea of me putting an article together every couple of weeks was first discussed, discussed last winter, I wasn't overjoyed. <laughs> Why? I think we could have predicted that. <laughs> I thought because it'll be something new, different, and meaningful for the fans, they said. Now, I thought. But it will work only if you tell it like it is, they said. Now, that got me. I'm no Howard Cosell, but why wouldn't I tell it like it is? <laughs> so I finally said, okay, let's do it. And I'm glad I did. You can hear like yeah. his, yeah. Like, he's like, I don't really want to do this. I can just picture it. Yeah. I just like, want to drive. That's a dumb idea. I want to drive. And I was just even thinking about like his education, all those kinds of things. Like yeah. this had to be pretty intimidating to him. Oh, yeah. To the intimidator himself, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I finally said, okay, let's do it. I'm glad I did. This is just the first one of these, and I'm already having fun. Wait until later in the season. I might even write about some inside stuff. Ooh. Maybe a little Grand National gossip. Mm. I'll even give some of those other rookies a plug in my column if they're nice. First, I got to tell it like it is if this idea is going to work. Okay, everybody wants to know why I ran so much higher than the others on the track at the Atlanta 500. I didn't qualify high, but there wasn't anybody else out there then uh, but me. When the race started, I was in the groove with everybody else, but my car felt like it was getting loose. I went higher, and all of a sudden my lap times got faster and more consistent. I caught up with Darrell Waltrip and was running the same lap speeds as the leader, Bobby Allison, for a long time. The next question was, what happened at Richmond? <laughs> now the telling it like it is part gets tough. <laughs> Does he have to own up to a mistake or something? I guess so. <laughs> what happened at Richmond was that I ran the car too fast and too deep into the corner, and so he spins out on like the fourth lap. Our team's captain made a mistake, and it brought out the first caution. He's the team's captain, okay? 
After the spin, it, after the spin, a problem developed with the chassis, and we never did get the handling dial back in. And that's enough about Richmond until next time. <laughs> so, he's not going to own up the very I know much. It, yeah, <laughs> that was difficult. Yeah, he's got, and he, now he's going to go to Rockingham. You want to know about Rockingham? Mm. It was a heck of a wreck, is what it was. So at Rockingham, um, that's the first race back. That's the first race after the Daytona 500. Kel Yarbrough and Donnie Allison had this crash on the back straightaway at Daytona, and they're mad and, and in trouble. Go to Rockingham, and like early in the top first 10 laps of the race, Kale and Donnie crash in front mm. of the field. And Dad okay. T-bones Donnie and bends the front of his car up. So Dad has this great Daytona 500 and then wrecks at Rockingham, spins at Richmond, but he has a reasonable uh, day at Atlanta before having engine trouble. So it's kind of stumbling along. He also says, uh, after, you know, that was one heck of a wreck. That's what it was. There was nothing I could do but save what I could. Anyways, we got the car back in the race and wound up finishing 12th. From what I read in the papers later, there were a lot of other guys who, were, who had plenty to say about Rockingham. I didn't see nothing but a big cloud of smoke. There's not too much to, else to say about Daytona. We, pit, we pitted at the wrong time once. But we developed rocker arm problems right after that, so finishing eighth wasn't so bad. It's just a great feeling to run in the front when we did. So this is something that I learned in these books, Kelly, that I had I did not know. And I've watched the Daytona 500 from 79 uh, more than a dozen times. And uh, I, I love watching. So Dad leads the very first lap of his career. There. In, in yeah. NASCAR in lap 44. And... <laughs> Yeah, now I remember that, <laughs> having worked on this. And so he leads really late into the race. Uh, like with 60 to go, he leads a few laps. He's got this uh, hood pin that fails. And so you can see him um, running along in like fourth or fifth place, and the edge of his hood is popped up. And it's going to get worse. But he waits until it's time to come down pit road for fuel, and as does everyone else. While he's on pit road fixing that hood pin, he loses the draft. So when he comes back out on the track, now he's three quarters of a lap behind, let's just say, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the Richard Petty, Dare Waltrip, and A.J. Foyt, the three that would cross the finish line to settle the win were the cars he was with. But now he's lost touch with them. I wondered, okay, if that's the case, how come in the running order he was the last car a lap down? So he's nearly two laps down mm -hmm. by the time the race is over. What happened? They mention it none, you know, they don't even talk about it in the race. But right here he tells us that he had a rocker arm issue. So he dropped a cylinder uh, late in the race that cost him all of that time. Got it, yeah. Um, so it's kind of nice, you know, after all these years being... To you know, read that and find yeah, that out, yeah. You know how damn yeah. plugged into this I am. So <laughs> he wants to go back to Atlanta. Jake Elder joined us as crew chief there, and he's going to be a great asset to Australian Racing. And to me. So Jake Elder is his crew chief, and he doesn't come on to the team until Atlanta. Yeah. So they race Rockingham. Several races in. Right. And so you remember Jake. Dad mm -hmm. end up. Uh, Dad would hire Jake uh, in the in the mid '80s to crew chief his Xfinity car. Mm -hmm. I remember. This was a very short lived arrangement. <laughs> I remember, Dad. And him. Uh, you know, so Dad had Rick Bost, which was one of his first employees, and Tony Sr., mm -hmm. and everything's going okay. They're doing well, but then for whatever reason, he's like, I'm going to bring in Jake Elder. I, there's a picture of him and Jake uh, with an ASA car that Dad owned, a Dylan chassis running somewhere up there in the ASA series. So Jake was around for several months doing multiple different races for Dad outside of the cup thing. But I remember when they went to race the Xfinity race or the Bush race at charlotte for the 600 in may it was really warm but uh we're in the condos that had just recently been built and Teresa would have a radio turned on mm -hmm. sitting in the middle of the room and we could just hear dad talking right whatever's going on and from the green flag to the checkered him and jake cussed each other <laughs> the entire 300 miles do you remember that no you don't, I don't know I couldn't believe that Teresa didn't turn it off. <laughs> as strict as she was on his right. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, a you know, they're running along. Dad's kicking everybody's butt. He wins this race easily. It was never in doubt, right? But to listen to him talk, you'd think that they were running fifth, struggling and fighting. And, yeah. yeah, terrible and frustrated. 
But dad's like half a lap in front of the field and they're arguing over what to do. And this is the do. 80s? This is like yeah. 85, 86. Yeah. Okay. Probably 86 because he ran that ASA car. But um, he's like a half a lap on the field and they're fussing and fighting over whether to take two tires or four the next pit stop. And I mean, they argued all the way onto pit road. And dad's like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And Jake's like, you hired me to do the thing? <laughs> Why'd you hire me if you don't want me to, to do the thing? But it was so funny, man, because it kind of reminds me of t- me and myself and Tony Jr. You know, we would argue and we thought we were the only ones in the conversation. Yeah. We didn't know the rest of the world was listening. Yeah, you don't think about that. No. But anyways, um, you know, Jake comes on to the team in Atlanta and they're both very complimentary of each other. Now, we will we will learn down the road that this this relationship gets gets tougher. I'll just say that. But right out of the gate in 79, Jake's got a tremendous amount of experience as a car builder and as a crew chief, and he's won so many races that losing just ain't his style. He's the help that we needed. And with him just being here, Roland Vladka, who is the team manager, has already got things better organized and working efficiently. And hey, how about that crew we've got? I've never seen a bunch that wanted to win so bad. They're working great together, and they're consistent. I think they impressed Jake at Atlanta. It was the team driver whoops, <laughs> that messed up. I cost them some time by coming in too fast. And once I got too close to the pit wall to be able to change left side tires, just a couple of little errors on the driver's part. Jake is helping me improve. I think the biggest thing I've learned so far is that this is a serious sport and that there's a lot more to it than just driving a race car. I'm beginning to see how important public relations can be. <laughs> now I wonder, you know, if that's really a line that he's putting in there or Joe's might put. Yeah, right. Whoever is, asked him to do this. <laughs> is Whitlock dropping in these, hey, man, this will make you sound like you're getting it, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, Dad says, you've really got to spend time with the fans accessory reps and potential sponsors and the press guys if you don't they'll soon forget who you are i'm really enjoying everything about grand national racing i honestly feel like it's what i'm supposed to be doing being in a competitive car with a good crew makes it even more enjoyable right now we just need something to change our luck but the way things are going we're getting closer and closer we got a chance to win soon oh well if i had won a race by now i'd have a lot more to talk about maybe next time and so they only go um, to they go to North Wilsboro after that article, and then they win Bristol. Oh, two races. Yeah, and then I mean, it's funny to uh, to read those articles, and when you're reading and you know we're reading a quote in a newspaper, you know Dad said the quote. Yeah, but it's where else has he ever sat down to write? You know, give it an hour right to really just kind of put his thoughts down yeah you know i'm thinking about just i'm trying to really as you're reading and i'm i'm envisioning the surroundings and what's around and what the world's like right because i think that's one of the hard parts for us in today's time not living in 79 to really understand that Mm -hmm. to really think i mean that this article of someone calling someone on a telephone, maybe a rotary telephone, you know, calling someone to get these quotes, to write it up, type it up, type it on a typewriter, whatever it looked like, you know, to get it to the printer, to get it to there. Like this is a process of time after events, you know, and after things are happening and all of those kinds of things. So it's just really interesting to try to think about that aspect of it. But, you know, I can remember too, like going, um, uh, to dinner with like Tom Higgins, who was wrote for the Charlotte Observer. Yeah. Like people would join us to dinner. get that kind of information, yeah. right? That's what you did. That's like, a great. That's yeah. a great point. Yeah. Um. You know, we'd go over to Joe Whitlock's, and he worked. He had workspace in yeah. his house. Yep. I, in my mind, am imagining Dad going over to Joe's house. Mm-hmm. Joe lived out on Brawley School Road, which was much different back then. Yeah. You know, hardly any houses out there at that time. And it wasn't a four lane road. I mean, everything about it was different. And Dad lived ten less than yeah. ten minutes away on Irvin Road. And so I'm imagining Dad going over to Joe's, sitting down, Joe riding this out with Dad. Yeah, coming over on a boat ride. Whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 Ride yeah. his boat over. Right. There. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's how this these articles were were written in yeah. my mind. It's it's interesting too that foresight of of we say the same thing. There's so many things in there that I thought about, like you, like I, and honestly, um, I 
I honestly have never had this thought that just came over when you read that article about dad losing his dad. Not not as close to getting his, you know, his first season there in 79, having lost his dad in 73, but literally the same thing happened to you. Your yeah. first your first full season, you know, going into the sport that you loved and dreamed of, of doing and everything, and that same thing happening. And then also, like how we talk about, you know, PR is important and all these things, and we come to you, you know, throughout your career, throughout the last 25 years to say, this is why we think you should do that. You know, this, this yeah. process has been there, right? Yeah. Of convincing and doing, thing. right? Yeah. So I'm hearing that whole same thing, and I'm like, dang, this sounds familiar, you yeah. know? <laughs> like, they you must know. have, they're, you know, De- one, number one, to your point, I think Dad was extremely fortunate to be surrounded by enough people that thought it was uh, worth their effort to to, to get him to, to help that point. him, yeah, yeah understand yeah. how important stuff stuff like this was, yeah. And when we would, um, and it was industry people, yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't like an agent going, "Oh man, this is a big break for me." These are already people, you know, with jobs and roles in the business that worked in NASCAR as an organization that were like, we got to take care of this guy. Yeah, he this can, guy's got something. He's got something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that too when you were reading about um, uh, Jake Elder coming on and the crew and, and those kinds of things. Like, you know, prior to that, dad being a racer, it was your friends and your buddies coming over after their daytime jobs and this kind of thing. And you had that investment all together and everything. Now he's having to lean on people that, you know, aren't maybe aren't those kind of friends and that closeness and all that kind of stuff and having to be accountable to them and, and yeah. all those kinds of things. It's a whole different ball game yeah. of what you knew, right? It's a different Dale Earnhardt. Yeah, right? yeah. It's of not him trying to figure, figure that out. Mike said it best. He's like, this is Dale Earnhardt at win zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got f- several more of these to read, and uh, we'll put a few Pretty more loud. Put, put a few more together and sit down and go through them and, and get your thoughts. It's been fun. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. I'm loving it. Hey, if you like that video, like and comment below, and don't forget to subscribe so you'll never miss another piece of Dirty Mode Media content.